have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let them have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go two. Well, good morning, Central Church family. Who's happy to be in church today? Can we give God a round of applause? Yeah. Ethan, I love that energy to go to. I wish I would have come up with that. That was really fun. And thank you guys for participating. If you're new here, my name's Corey, one of the pastors that gets to serve with this amazing church called Central. I also get to serve with our family of churches called Water's Edge. And a special shout out as we wrap up this series to our Zeal Jamaica family who is tuning in with us today. Can we give a round of applause for our church family down in Jamaica? Wagwan Zeal. Bless up. Yeah, let's go. Well, guys, we're going to jump right in and finish out this series that we kicked off the year with, like Ethan said, called Go To. Now, if it's your first time and we've been saying Go To and chanting Go To, you're like, Go To where? Like, where are we going, right? Go T-O. It's not Go T-O, it's Go T-W-O. Go is in the number two. And I'm just going to take the first few moments before we jump in today's passage of Scripture and give us a quick recap of where we've been. Because one of my favorite things about our church family is we invite, right? We invite new people to come to church with us all the time because we know, at least I know, that what God is doing in here is too good to experience alone and not share it. So for the sake of somebody that may have invited somebody new or somebody new watching online at Zeal or watching online at our Central Church family, I'm just going to give us like a seven-minute breakdown of the last four sermons. Y'all ready? Some of you are like, you talk fast. What are you about to do? I have them on my second. During our, our 22 day fast, you're not supposed to talk about fasting, but whatever. Uh, during our 22 day prayer and fasting, um, by the way, thank you guys that have joined in. And if it's not too late, you can pick up a Devo and do that with us. But I gave up caffeine as one of my things. Some of you are like, I knew something was different about you this month. Um, but the fast is over and uh, I'm on my second cup. So let's go. Um, yeah. So we kicked it off um, talking about Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. If you've been brought up in church, you know that's what it's called. But I kind of threw out there that I think there's a better title than the Sermon on the Mount. Don't worry, the titles in your Bible aren't original God-inspired text. That was man-made. You can cross that out. You can change it. So I encourage everybody to maybe mark that out and change it to Sermon on the Monarchy. Because like I've said before, and I'll keep saying it till my dying breath, Jesus' message was not... Pray a prayer and get out of hell. That was not Jesus' message. Jesus' whole message was the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The unseen kingdom of a transformed mind and renewed heart that permeates and propagates all throughout eternity and all throughout humanity is now here. And he, Jesus, is the king. That was his message. So the kingdom is here. And then he looked at all of us through the barrel of antiquity and he said, now follow me into this kingdom. And that's what the Sermon on the Monarchy, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, really breaks down. What it looks like to walk, talk, and follow Jesus in the kingdom of God. And in week one, we kind of pulled out this one verse um, where I kind of pulled those two words go to from. By the way, a buddy of mine sent me this week. He got go to tattooed on his forearm. Talk, that is not official central endorsement of tattoos. Nobody write me emails. Again, if you ever want to write me an email, it is craig at centralholland.org. I will say that joke until I die because I don't want y'all emails. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, we're like committed to this mantra. But, but where he got that from or where we got that from in Matthew 5, Jesus lobs out some theological hand grenades. And he says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We all know that, right? Like people fight each other to get ahead. And he says, but I have a better way. First, he says, when someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other one, turn the other cheek. And we've all heard that. But in his time, just to recap it, it was not acute cultural colloquialism. They would actually get slapped in the face by Roman soldiers. And, and, and what he was teaching us is true strength. You men in the house, you women in the house that want to be strong men, strong women. You're working out, you're bench pressing, you're doing everything. Yeah, do it, do it. But he's saying true strength is not found in how hard you can hit, but rather in self-control. If you don't have to hit, if you don't have to speak back, 
turn the other cheek. Woo, that was deep. And then he lobbed another one out there and he said, if someone sues you for your tunic, give him your cloak as well. In other words, true wealth is not found in how much you can hoard and have, but rather how much you can give, amen? Three of you, some of us are still working on that, I get it. But yeah, but we know it is better to give than to receive. That's why as a parent on Christmas Day, you love seeing your kids open their presents and it's so much more joyous than when you unwrap your own. Because true wealth is found in what we can give, not what we can have. And then he launched the nuclear theological bomb that was this statement. When someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two. When someone forces you to go one mile, go two. Everybody say go two. And if you weren't here, the law of the mile was a reality they lived in. This was not, again, a colloquialism to work harder. This was the oppressment law called the law of the mile, which stated a Roman soldier could make any Jewish person carry their equipment a thousand paces anywhere they chose to remind the Jewish people, we own you. You belong to us. We're in charge. You're not. And the Jewish audience that Jesus was speaking to hated the law of the mile. They would mark it off so they knew this is the bare minimum that is required of me when I am called upon to go one. And Jesus looked at this audience, this people, in this context, and he said that thing that you absolutely despise and hate, when you are called to do it, instead of doing the bare minimum that is required of you, I want you to do twice as much. And we translated that for all of us today. What is required of us? Not sin, when somebody's asking you to sin, do twice as much sin, that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is when life, when relationships, when jobs, when life requires things of us, what does it look like? To not define success as the bare minimum, but rather, like Jesus would say, experience and show true freedom, true grace, true mercy, true gospel representation, true peace. It's all found in the second mile. And so what does it look like, we talked about, to go to in our workplace, to go to in our relationships, to go to in our church family. That was week one. Whew. That was a lot. Speaking of, we're going to be kicking off this series down at LifeBridge Church next week. It's going to be kind of fun. LifeBridge is about 30 minutes south of here, one of our church family churches um, down in South Haven. I I'll just, I'll selfishly ask, any of you want to go to next week? Come here for the nine o'clock at that kickoff of intentions. It's going to be amazing. If you've ever been in a relationship, want to be in a relationship or are in a relationship, don't miss next week in this next series. But go to the nine and then come join me and get rowdy down at South Haven and Life Ridge. Anybody want to go to 30 minutes? You got time? Two guys. Thank you. I know you. I expect to see you there. No, I'm just kidding. But come on down and help us kick it off. So that was week one. Week two, we dove in even deeper. We talked about go to forgiveness. How Jesus says that we as Christ followers are required to be a forgiving people. And everybody said? Yeah. <laughs> right? Because the first mile, like Ethan said, is hard sometimes. But he says a bare minimum requirement to follow Jesus is to forgive as we have been forgiven. Like the prayer that Craig brought us through last week. And then we talked about the extra mile, the second mile to go to forgiveness is this word reconciliation. Literally, Jesus says that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation and we are his ambassadors of that ministry. So as Christ followers, we are to be a forgiving people, but forgiving is mile one because it's all about us. You can forgive someone without ever talking to them. You can forgive someone without ever moving towards them. I forgive you. It's internal. It's mile one. Reconciliation means you got to take a step towards that person. Reconciliation is often very uncomfortable, but it is what we are called to. And many of us know that, yes, you can get some peace when you can forgive. But, man, there's a whole other level of peace and joy found when we can reconcile together. Whew, that was week one, week two. And then Pastor Craig broke down in week three what it looks like to go to in our giving, what it looks like to go to in generosity. Are we defining success by the bare minimum? Oh, this is what's required of me. I guess I'll do it. Or are we looking for opportunities to bless God and bless people with our generosity above and beyond what is required of us? That was a convicting message for myself. Amen. Lord, I needed that one. And then we, some of you grew up Catholic and you're like, he did the thing. Some of you are like, can you do that if you're not Catholic? Yes. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's okay. We believe in all three. <laughs> A delayed laugh on my right side. I like it. And then week four, he broke down go to prayer. Hey, talking about the difference between Kava and Kavanaugh. I don't even know if I pronounced that right. Kavanaugh, Kavanaugh, Kava, Kavanaugh, right? Leave it to Pastor Craig to break out the Greek and Hebrew. You know that wasn't a Corey message, right? 
But the difference between repetitive good prayer and what it looks like relational and redemptive prayer. Ooh, it was good. And today we're going to wrap it up with what I think is the most popular verse for people that don't go to church. If you know somebody that don't go to church, that don't go to God, they all know this verse, right? All of us that go to church, we know John 3.16, right? Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. If you don't go to church, maybe you know Proverbs 3.16 from like Tebow's Eye Blacks. But, but this is the verse that everyone that doesn't go to church quotes. And I had a Bible, but I don't have it. So I'm going to see if I can do it from memory. No, I'm just kidding. It'll be on the screen for us. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. We're going to start in the first two verses. Y'all ready? ready? Three of you. I'm going to do it anyway. Here we go. Matthew 7, verse 1 says, do not judge. See what I'm talking about? How many of you know somebody that don't go to church that said, don't the Bible say you can't judge? Don't judge me. That's in the Bible. Sure enough, Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. He says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Clear as day, mile one, to follow Jesus, we don't judge people. Now, let me clarify this. What this does not mean is that we don't show good judgment. That is a different thing. We should show good judgment, you know what I mean? Like when we say, oh, we don't judge, that doesn't mean like, hey, jump off the cliff and you'll get hurt. Well, I don't judge, let's go. No, like show good judgment, right? And there's, a, there's something in the Bible called discernment where we understand good and evil. It's not saying we shouldn't be discerning people with good judgment. What it's saying is when it comes to the standard, the measure we place on other people, understand that Jesus does not want us to be hypocrites and that we should hold ourselves and even we are held to the same standard to which we hold other people. Now that word there. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I'm glad he specified that. It reminds me of... Um, I grew up um, where some of you guys know me. I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie. Um, some of you think that's sinful. I think it brings me closer to God because um, when I almost die, I'm really grateful I'm alive. Uh, <laughs> so whether that's like surfing or scuba diving or like skydiving or bungee jumping, like I love all of it. Let's go. Anybody want to go? Let's do it. Um, but that all started when I was a little kid. Like at four years old, I went to my first uh, theme park. It was Disney World. And I got to go on one of my very first rides, Splash Mountain. Anybody ever read Splash Mountain? Some of you are like, that's not like super thrilling. But it is for a four-year-old, right? And I remember I go on to Splash Mountain. And I, um, like, I know I'm like super tall now, but I was not very tall then. And um, see, I knew some of you would laugh at that. And that is insensitive. Um, <laughs> Ah, oh, it stings every time. I, I made this joke in the first service, but literally every time I meet some of you in the lobby or just around at our other churches and people are used to seeing me on the screen, they'll always go, I thought you were taller. And I'll say, I thought you were nicer. Um, a guy came up to me in between services and he goes, you're so tall. I was like, bless you, brother. You lying for Jesus. I appreciate you. But anyways, so I was short as a four-year-old and uh, we go up to Splash Mountain and you know, like all the roller coasters, they have the measure, right? They have the, the thing and you got, it's like, you got to be this tall to get on the ride. Well, I was with my grandfather, who suffice to say is a big old boy, and my dad, who's like six foot something, these are big dudes, and they kind of like sneak me in in between them, you know, and I pulled the whole like bust a move into the line. And I make it on there, and we didn't quite think it through because we get on the, on the ride, and the lap bar comes down, and my grandfather is, like I said, he's a big guy. And uh, so his belly kept the bar a little bit like two feet off of my waist. And I'm riding in between them and I'm loving this ride and all of a sudden the Splash Mountain part comes and we hit that down thing and I kid you not, I came flying out of the seat completely out, like about to like splash Corey on the mountain. And my grandfather and dad both grab my legs and pull me back in the ride. Now you would think a child would be like, ah, no. And I was like, yes. Let's do it again. Because it was the first time I'd ever felt zero G, you know, that like, woo, and the addiction started. I loved it from there. And so fast forward the next year, I, I was loving roller coasters and I'm five years old and we go to Bush Gardens because I heard Bush Gardens had even better rides. So we go to Bush Gardens and I ride the Scorpion and I ride all the rides, but they had just built, this will date me a little bit if you're familiar with theme parks, they had just built like the, the Kumba or the Montu, the big one before all the new ones. And it was supposed to be like one of the fastest in the country. And I was so excited to ride it. And I remember I would go to that line and we're looking and the height, because it's one of the newest roller coasters in the country, was like up here. And I'm like right here. 
And I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, we're not gonna make it, we're not gonna make it. And my mom is very resourceful and she saw it and she knew how much I cared about getting on this ride, so I had to measure up. And so she pulls me aside and um, I, I don't know another way to say this. Um, she pulled out her purse and she said, take off your shoes. I was like, okay. And then she proceeded to put some things in my shoes that only women carry in their purses. And that's where I'll leave it, if you know what I'm saying. I was five, I didn't know what they were. I thought my mom brought like tall infusions into the shoe. But anyways, it made me, some of you are laughing because you know what I'm talking about, but like it made me taller. I was five, I didn't care. And so like I go on and I like spike my hair up so I could measure up. And I get to the front of this line and I'm so excited and I'll never forget the guy goes, he stops me. And that's like the curse of death when you're a kid. He's like, hey you. And you're like, man, I know I'm short. Why you gotta call me out? And he pulls me up there and I was like, I was over it and then he smashed my hair down. I don't even know if it's legal to touch a child like that that is not your kid, but he did it to me. He smashed my hair down and he goes, sorry man, you don't measure up, you're not tall enough. And man, guys, I was destroyed. I, was, I started tearing up and I walked away and I started crying. And behind me about five groups deep was this other little kid that was like an inch shorter than me. And I watched him as I was walking away and, it, and he walked by and they didn't even stop him and he walked right in. And I remember watching that kid and I, I looked at my parents and I go, that's not fair. I'm taller than him. Why? I don't understand. And they had to like calm me down and console me and suffice it to say, I never forgave Bush Gardens. I have never been back to this day. I need to go back to week two and work on forgiveness and reconciliation with Bush Gardens. But there's something about measuring up, right? Because when we read that verse, you're like, man, I don't, I'll struggle with judgment. Like I'm not a judgmental person, right? Like who, who are we judging? But I like that he, he clarifies, he says, and the measure you use will be measured to you. And I think in life it's easy to go, we, we, it's easy to identify like me when somebody else is held to a lesser standard than us. And we're like, that's not fair. But to me, that's not struggling with judgment. That's just feeling like it's unfair. To me, judgment comes across when it's flipped. When we hold a high measure or a high standard for some people, and we don't hold it for ourselves. You know what I'm talking about? Like it doesn't say the measure to which you use will be measured back to you except for your boss. Like how many of us go to work and we hold our bosses, our managers, our CEO to a high standard? Well, they're the boss, they should be on time. Well, they're the boss, they should be. Well, they're, it, but, but by this verse, the standard to which you hold your boss is the standard to which you hold yourself. It's quiet. It's real quiet. Can I go further? I'm going to. <laughs> it doesn't say with the measure to which you use, it will be measured back to you except for your political leaders. How many of us know like we've been like, oh, I can't believe that person did that. They're a senator. I can't believe that person did that. They're a governor. I can't believe that person did that. They're a president. Well, by this verse, the standard to which you hold your president is the standard to which will be held to you. Because it does not give a caveat. Oh, it's so quiet. I love this. Can I go further? <laughs> Some of you are like, no. It does not say, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you except for your pastors, except for your church leaders. So you could infer the measure to which you hold your pastor to is the measure to which you are held to. Now, let me be clear here. The Bible does state that pastors, elders, our people in authority and leaders are held to a higher standard. Amen? Amen? By God. And we should hold ourselves to a higher standard because it is something very weighty and very heavy to say, I love God, I love Jesus, and I love God and I love Jesus so much. I want to help with the best of my ability and integrity and character to try and transmit his message and his word and it, it, like basically say, follow me as I follow Jesus. So yes, we and God holds them to a higher standard, but according to this verse, the measure to which you hold others is the measure to which you will be held. And I just wanna raise that question like, why do we want to hold others to a higher standard than we hold ourselves? You ever think about that? Like, why, what is it? What is it about, like, this platform? Let's just go back to the church example. What is it about this two and a half feet that makes us think anybody up here is better than anybody out there? This is just wood and carpet. There ain't nothing anointed about it. 
It, all it means is us up here are the same as you out there because the ground is level at the foot of the cross. But this messes us up so much because here's the deal. A platform does not equal perfection. Amen. Like elevation does not equal sanctification. A stage does not equal who up here is your savior. But this messes us up in Christianity so much. I taught a whole series at Zeal down in Jamaica called Church Hurt. How many of you have ever heard somebody say, man, I was hurt by the church or I'm experienced church hurt, right? Let me, let me just give you that whole series in a nutshell. With grace, I say this, the church can't hurt you. The church, the organism, the bride of Christ, the global movement, the ecclesia of God's people, the church as an entity cannot hurt you. And if you're saying I've been hurt by the church or the church hurt me, I understand what you're saying. But what you're really saying is a person hurt me. People hurt me. And one of the greatest examples of this I've seen time and time again is when people hold people on a platform to a higher standard than they hold themselves. And we go, they're on the platform, they're on the stage, and we start to confuse the stage with our Savior. And we start to put people in the position Jesus is supposed to be. And the person lets us down, or the person sins, or the person hurts us, and we correlate that with how God loves us and God treats us. But here's, the, here's my message for us today in this first half. None of us measure up to God's holy standard. Not a single person in this life will ever not let you down. And that is so disappointing because why do we want to hold our leaders to a different standard? Because we want to hope that somebody's got it all together. We want to hope that somebody's doing it right because we know in our heart of hearts that we've messed up, that we don't measure up. But here's the good news, Central. Here's the good news, Zeal. Someone does measure up and his name was Jesus and he died on that cross cross for us and if we will keep him on the platform and praise him and keep him in that position, ooh, it helps us not judge people. I mean, this is why Paul in 2 Timothy, I think I have that verse up there, or in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says this, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions and prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority or your leaders, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Paul's saying, hey, pray for your leaders. So here's the deal. If you like Biden, pray for Biden. If you don't like Biden, pray more for Biden. Amen. And every president that was and every president that is to come. I mean, I, I just say, man, for your spiritual leaders, if you're a member of Central, man, be, please be praying for Pastor Craig. Please be praying for Mike. For, for Lynn. Can, I, can I just be transparent with you guys today? I'm going to ask, will you be praying for me? Like, I'm genuinely asking, you see, a lot of times we think that, you know, the platform means perfection, but I'll just be real with you guys. I'm going through one of the hardest seasons of my life I have ever been through. My family's going through some really hard things with health, and, and then even my own marriage is just going through some really tough times, if I'm being real. Nothing unethical or immoral, but y'all know, like, life stuff just hits, and it's hard. And so just as one of your pastors, I'm just going to ask you, will you do that for me? Will you pray for me this season? And I know it's weird for a pastor to get on stage and be like, I need help. I need your help. And I'm so grateful for this church, for Pastor Craig and our group of elders and, and the people that are walking with me through a tough season. And that's what we do as a church. We recognize that we don't judge one another. We don't hold people to a standard. We don't hold ourselves. But rather we pray for one another and lift up one another. And let me be clear one more time. What I am not saying is we should lower the standard for our presidents. What I am not saying is we should lower the standard for our pastors. That is not what I'm saying. What I am saying is... Let's raise the standard for all of us. Because why would we hold them to a standard we don't hold ourselves to? Why would we measure them by a measurement we don't measure up to? Because Jesus here is just saying, I don't want my followers to be hypocrites. I want us to not be judging, to not be holding people to a standard we don't live by. And then, so that's mile one, Jesus takes us to mile two. Somebody say, go two. Oh, okay, let's do it. Let's go too. He then says in verses three through five, bam, can we give a hand to our tech team? They're amazing, by the way. I love you guys. Paul, Kim, Kathleen, y'all are phenomenal. Um, he says, verse three and five, 
after he tells us not to measure each other's by a standard that we don't hold. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? Anybody remember that social media fad, planking, right? Jesus was the original planker, right? He says, three of you, thank you for laughing at that. I appreciate it. Um, it's true though. So he says, why, like, you need to take the plank out of your eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your, your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. Jesus doesn't want us to be hypocrites. He says, you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, I believe in visuals, so I'm going to use a visual. This is an example that uh, an amazing pastor, uh, Pastor Stephen down in Charlotte, shared, and I'm going to put my own spin on it. But Jesus here doesn't want us to be planking. He doesn't want us to have a case of plank eye. And isn't it funny, like, this is a metaphor. Obviously, people weren't walking around like this, right? Like, I don't even know how that worked. But metaphorically, this is what some of us look like. This is what some of us look like in church. I can't believe they're wearing that. Pop, right? Like, we're just walking around. We're like, man, did you hear what's going on with them? And meanwhile, we just look like this to everybody else. We're pointing the specks in their life and their, in their marriage and their relationship. And meanwhile, we're walking around with a case of plank eye, knocking everybody out metaphorically with our hypocrisy. Thank you. One guy's like, yes, we do struggle with that. I've seen those churches. Now, I mean, not here, but, you know, other places. <laughs> so, so to kind of land the plane today, I just want to talk about how we get these planks. Because again, it's like, man, I don't walk around judging people, man. I feel like I'm doing okay with the first mile, but how do I end up with the planks? And more importantly, how do I go to in this area and remove the planks out of my eye? So, so to do that, I'm going to ask for some volunteers. We're going to do a little participation. If you are a couple and you want to volunteer and come on stage with me, can you raise your hand, please? That's exactly what I thought. Did you see that, Craig? We need to work on our church participation. Everybody is terrified. You're raising your hand for your husband. No, I'm sorry. She, she beat you to it. You guys, come on up. No, no, no. Y'all two right there, red shirt and gray sweater. Come on, come on. Y'all give them a hand as they come up. He was pointing at somebody else. It's okay. Y'all have to keep clapping because they're moving slow. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, while they come on up, I just want to make this a, a, a practical example. Ooh, and I got a microphone. This is great. All right. So let's meet our wonderful volunteers. Central, next time we ask for a volunteer, I expect all of you to raise your hand. Don't worry. We're never going to put you in danger, okay? Okay, now for a live couple counseling session in front of everyone. Um, I'm just kidding, completely. What's your name? Jen. Jen, wait, can we hear? Yeah. Jen. And? Nate. Jen and Nate. I'm, I may ask you one more question this whole time. Don't worry. This is, this is all hypothetical. Let me be clear. I, do, I genuinely don't know you guys. I have no idea what's going on in your life, so I'm just going to make this up. Y'all cool with that? <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So let's just, for example, we're talking about how we end up with a case of plank guy, how we end up with our planks and what it looks like to eventually be struggling with this judgment thing. Okay. So let's, let, let's just throw out an example. Let's say, um, Nate, what's your favorite food? Barbecue ribs. Barbecue. Any, any barbecue fans in the house? Yeah. Woo. I had somebody uh, grill me a steak last week to end my fast because I also gave up meat. Best steak I ate in my life. And it's worth it when you grill here because you have to grill in like two degrees weather. That's insane. But anyway, so you, so you, said, uh, you said barbecue ribs. So let's say he loves his barbecue ribs, but it was, it was Jen? Jen? Yeah. So, but let's say, you know, uh, Jen and him are over at, at Nate's parents' house. And Nate, your mom makes some barbecue ribs. And she puts those barbecue ribs down on the plate. And, and, and Nate says, wow, mom. I love these barbecue ribs. They're the best I've ever had in my life. Nobody makes barbecue ribs like you do, Mom. Now, what is Jen here? You can take this. What did Jen just hear? What Jen just heard was, oh, nobody makes barbecue ribs like your mama? Guess who's not making barbecue ribs for you no more? And Jen is a little offended. She's a little offended. And now she's kind of like, oh, so you don't think a little bit of judgment coming, right? And all of a sudden, she's got a case of plank guy, and she puts her plank in. Okay, it's just a little, just a little offense, right, Jen? It's not a big deal. You see if you cook those for him again, you know. Now let's fast forward, okay? Some of you are like, ah, oh, that's funny. Some of you are like, that happened last week. <laughs> but let's fast forward a little bit. So now, you know, Jen's a little offended or whatever. Um, but let's say the, the following week, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's, Nate? Yep. Nate's birthday. It's Nate's birthday. And, and what Jen doesn't know is Nate grew up in a family where birthdays were a big deal. Anybody grew up in a family like that? Like birthdays are a really, really big deal, right? But in Jen's family, 
Why is a birthday a big deal? You didn't do anything. You just came out of the womb, right? So they, you know, some cake or whatever, not a big deal. So Jen's a good wife. She's got, she's got a present for Nate, you know, prepared and a dinner at the end of the day. But in Nate's family, he would wake up and he got his favorite breakfast, pancakes, and he had balloons. And the birthday was a big deal all day. So come the next week, Nate wakes up on his birthday and there's no pancakes. There's no balloons. And all of a sudden, Nate is a little offended. And he's like, does she even care about me? Where are my pancakes? Why doesn't she ask me what I want for my birthday? I don't know if that's it, but, and he's just a little offended right now. She has a plan, she just doesn't know what she doesn't know. But all of a sudden, just a little bit, he's just a little offended. And all of a sudden he's got a case of plank eye, right? It's just a little bit of judgment, man. She, I don't know if she really cares about me. But here's the deal, when it comes to like marriage and life, it's not like one or two big offenses. It, or, you know, we don't get offended every night. We get offended a lot, amen? Like, we, some of you are like, yeah, no, no, we get offended a lot. Oh, gosh. Oh, here we go. <laughs> and it's funny, one, one little case of being offended may not, you know, cause a lot of judgment. Here, Jen, will you come around to this side? But, but like, little bit by little bit, like, let's say, um, uh, let's see, what are some other examples I have here? Let, let's say, let's say even like when it comes to church, like we, we can all get offended in different ways. Like let's say Jen is the representative of the younger generation in church and, and, and uh, Nate is a representative of the older generation in church. And, and, and she's like, man, I like the music loud because I can't sing and I, and I don't want to hear myself sing and I love it. But then he's like, man, will you turn it down? I can't hear myself think. And she's like, why don't you let me worship the way I worship? And she's a little offended at, you know, the, at Nate's generation. But then Nate's like, why has it got to be so loud for you to worship? Can't we worship the way we used to in the nice quiet hymn that lasts 15 minutes? I'm just kidding. I love hymns. I love hymns. I really, really do. But in like different areas in life, this can happen over and over and over again where we just get a little offended, a little offended. And then all of a sudden, like here, no, trust me, we have, a, a, y'all want to give me some of your practical examples from your real life? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but little by little, so let's say this, so let's, let's go back to marriage. So let's say Jen, when they were dating, oh man, she loved Nate because he was the life of the party. Right? Nate would walk into any room and just light it up, and he had jokes and he had stories. And then Nate, man, he loved Jen when they were dating because she was so quiet and mysterious. Right? Oh, I just love that about her. But now they're married, and Jen looks at, you know, loud, vivacious Nate, and she's looking at him and she's like, Do you ever shut up? Right? The very thing she loved about him is now the thing she can't. And then he's looking at her and she's like, will you just talk to me, please? It's like you never communicate. I heard an old pastor say one time, when you're dating, opposites attract. When you're married, opposites attack. <laughs> and so y'all are just offended by stuff what you used to love. Go ahead. Yeah. Put the planks in. And we can do this, okay, we can do this politically. Y'all love it when I talk politics, right? I'm not endorsing anybody. I'm just helping us be better Christ followers, even politically. But let's say Democrat, Republican, I don't know for sure. Don't worry. No, she, the faces they gave me, don't worry. But let's say she's like, I heard the Democrats are going to forgive all my student loans. Praise God, because, man, I, I worked so hard. And then Nate's like, what are you talking about? I went to college and I worked hard and I paid off my loans. You Democrats, you Republicans. And just because we don't understand the context of where people are coming from, we get offended by the other party and being offended and offended. Keep going. I mean, I know you all offend each other a lot. Here you go. You can keep putting it in there. And it's so funny because now, whether it's a couple or whether it's a church or a business or the country, we find ourselves offense after offense after offense, being offended, offended. And now we're like, hey, Nate's like, hey, 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 Jen, how come we don't talk anymore? <laughs> Fine, I'll take the garbage out. I'll always take the garbage out, right? <laughs> and Jen's like, hey, Nate, it's been, it's been forever since we went to Olive Garden. <laughs> Just feels like I don't see you much anymore. I'll take the kids to school again. Sure, it's always mine. And offense after offense after offense, we build up offense. <laughs> and this is when judgment becomes easy. Because now it's not Jen and Nate together as a couple fighting the battles of the world together, united. 
But little offense after little offense, there's a fence, there's a wall, there's an emotional barrier between them. And it's so easy to go, well, he always, and she never. Or in like church, well, that ministry always does this, and they just all when, and if they always, or, or, or in politics, like it kills me in politics, so like we'll blame it on the government. We'll be like, well, the government, they, 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 they. Can I just say it? Like the government is us. Our government in the United States is we the people. So we get to vote. We are participating. If you're not participating in it, why are you complaining about it? And it's so easy to say they and them and it's their fault when in all actuality all it is is the enemy through our own offenses and judgment has built up a wall between God's people that were supposed to be united. That's why in John chapter 17, Jesus said one thing. He said, God, I pray for them, for all of my followers, that they would be one just as you and I are one, that they would be one. The one thing Jesus prayed for us is that we would be united. So is it any surprise that offense after offense after offense, the enemy sets us up to judge one another and be divided? And so how do we remove the planks? Now in the past, Jen and Nate, I, I would have just quoted the great theologian Elsa and say, you just got to let it go, right? <laughs> just drop it. But if we're being honest, guys, by the way, thank you, you are amazing. But if we're being honest, it's not that easy. It's not that easy just to be like, we let it go. We're just gonna let it go, right? To go to, I, I had a young man last week after Craig's message, he came up to me, he, he's a Hope College student. And he said, man, I'm really struggling in worship because I see so many of you passionately praying and, and singing to God. And I just want to want God like that. And I told him, I gave him the example that sometimes God, like a good dad, you know, with a little kid, when you're teaching a kid how to walk, you would be a very, very bad father if you held his hands until he was 5, 10, 50 years old. A good dad actually lets go and moves away a little bit so you can build your muscles and move on your own. Spiritually, I think sometimes our heavenly father, being a good father, actually goes, come on, build those muscles. And so there feels like there's distance so that way we can learn to pursue him. But ultimately, he said, well, Corey, what do you do? And what I said is, man, I just, whenever I'm feeling distant from God or I'm feeling like I'm not feeling it, I just try and remind myself that I offended God and that my sins and my wrongs built up a fence, a wall between God and I. And God, in the form of his son Jesus on a cross, where I was, I was supposed to be beaten to a pulp. I was supposed to have my skin scratched. I was supposed to have a crown in my head. I was supposed to be drenched in my own blood. I was supposed to die on that cross like each and every one of us was. But for the grace of God, he sent his son and covered me in his grace. And because there was grace, he removed the wall. He forgave all my offenses. And if I have received that grace, who am I? not to show grace. So Jen, come here. I just want you to look at Nate and say, I'm sorry about the pancakes. And take that, take that plank out, say, there's grace. And Nate, come over here and just say, I like your barbecue ribs, sweetie. And say, there's grace and drop it. And offense after offense, if we will just stop as people, as couples, as churches, and recognize, keep going. Y'all going to tear this down. This is marriage counseling for y'all. Here we go. And just say there's grace. Somebody say there's grace. No matter what it is that's gotten in your way, just say there's grace. Somebody say there's grace. No matter how much they offended you, no matter how much you want to judge them, because we have been covered in his grace, somebody say there's grace. Y'all give these amazing people a hand. Thank you, guys. And there's something so sweet about remembering that the reason we can show grace is because no matter the amount of offenses and planks we built up between God and I, there was one person that showed us grace. And so today I just, I wanted to tell you the title of my message, y'all didn't know this was all an intro. <laughs> the title of my message is Go to Grace. Because I think what will help us 
not just walk the first mile, not be judging, hold the same standard, hold high standards for our leaders, hold high standards for our pastors, but hold high standards for ourselves, mile one. But whenever we start to build up those planks, instead of looking at Jen or looking at Nate and go, you need to take care of that, instead of looking at the other political party or looking at the other ministry or looking, you need to do that, we just stop and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I have received so much grace. And because I have received that good grace, that amazing grace, there's grace. And I'm gonna work on the planks in my eye. I'm gonna work on my hypocrisy. And then I'm gonna pray for you because there's grace. Somebody say there's grace. And so we'll finish out this series and we'll finish out today with this simple time of worship. We're gonna sing one more song. The title of the song is Good Grace by Hillsong. And it starts a little chill, but it picks up. But here's the deal. If you've been a recipient of God's grace, I would implore you, encourage you to let him know. Let him know how grateful you are. I like to use the word rowdy. You know, get a little rowdy because he deserves it. And so in this last song, I would just encourage you, if you've never raised your hands in worship, maybe give him a worship frisbee. Start small, you know, like here. Maybe if you've done some worship frisbees in the past, give him a little one arm. If you're a single lady, put the left one up. Let everybody know. If you... But if God has forgiven you, redeemed you, and poured his grace out on you, I would encourage you as we sing this last song to just thank him for that good grace. Will you stand with me as I pray and as we sing? Father, I thank you for your grace, God. God, I pray that someone today that's been struggling with judging themselves, whether it's at Zeal or on our online church family at Central or right here, God, that today would be a day where they see you, where they see themselves through your perspective, God, as recipients of grace. And they would stop judging themselves. God, I pray for any of us that are struggling being judgmental. Maybe it's a certain people group, maybe it's a person, maybe if it's any, another denomination, whatever. God, I pray today that you would do a Holy Spirit work within us and that we would become more in tune with how much grace you have given us and we would be able to stop judging other people, but rather praying for them and lifting them up. And God, right now, I just pray for anyone under the sound of my voice, whether in Jamaica or here, that hasn't experienced your grace, that today would be a day that they would open their arms and hearts and lives up for the forgiveness and grace that is found in you, Jesus. Lord, we come together as your people and sing this. We sing about your good grace. And we're grateful for it. In your name we pray and sing. Amen.